America for Africans worldwide. Motherlands calling its diaspora home. Join my voice. Join my team. Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa. And he's truly, I mean, really, really, I think 20 years back, my king, I mean, I, I, I'm just waiting for the audience to join me tonight because what I'm seeing here, what I'm seeing in front of me, of course, I do know you, but this image that I know you is from your document, your official document. Um, but this one, mm -mm, mm -mm. so what happened? Did you go into uh into a sauna? Did you go or is just the refreshments and the the walking in the park in the hills in the mountains all around Zimbabwe and Africa? Why are you looking so young? What's the secret? Oh no, no, I just I went I, I went I went I went home. I saw my mother and she she advised me. She says, "No man, you must clean up a little bit and you know you're handsome and what she so she she spoke to me nicely." And uh, she managed to get me to to do some facelift a little bit. You know, after breastfeeding, you always have new ideas, you know. So I, I was home with her for the weekend, and uh, I, I came out with a new look, you know. You are super smart, honestly speaking. You're really super smart. And I, like, I was like, hey, wait a minute. Who is this young guy, you know? And, I, and, and, I just, and a lot I just yeah. thought I'll leave a little bit. I'll, I'll leave a little bit of the beard, you know. But the temptation was great just to clean up everything, and I'll, I'll look like a thirty-five year old boy. <laughs> and, and and that would be some trouble with the queen, isn't it? Yeah, the queen is not a, the queen is not a problem. Maybe there will be a problem with the extended extended small houses, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, so when they are extended houses. So that's exactly where the problem should come from. Anyways, um, yeah, there have been a lot of cooking and celebration these days. What has been cooking around? What has been happening? I mean, you, particularly not only on the continent, you heard about also, you know, crisis in the Ukraine. Do you think this could happen like the second, second World War where probably some people will have to relocate, remove their forces on our continent so they focus on their own issues? That's what Africans are thinking and are saying. Do you have any clue? My 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 worry is not more for for Ukraine, though I have some friends in Donetsk and in Ukraine mainland and stuff like that. But my, my worry is the attitude of the superpowers, the attitude of Russia, the attitude of America. You know, in our lifetime, we have seen the war in Afghanistan. We have seen the war in Iraq. We have seen the war in uh, in Syria. We have seen the war in Libya. We are still witnessing the war in in Congo. And uh, these these superpowers have no respect for small countries. They have no respect for small economies. And they want something in Ukraine, whether it is gas or it is coal. Uh, and they will get it at any cost. And so as the appetite of materials around the first world is increasing, uh, sooner or later we'll begin to see the, 
first world countries, which are the NATO countries, inclusive to Russia, to France, to Britain, Germany, and now China, walking into small countries and imposing themselves. They start off with colonialism. If colonialism doesn't work, they move over into sanctions. If sanctions don't work, they negotiate for regime change uh, through opposition parties and civil wars. If civil wars don't change, they come for an onslaught, an onslaught military uh, takeover. And uh, we, we, we begin to see if the Russians are killing fellow Ukrainians who are Russians. Basically, they're divided by a river, a small little stream that divides Russia and Ukraine. These are, these are, these are tribes, literally, from the Balkan, Balkan countries, the Bolsheviks. And with, with that in mind, we need to learn as Africa. When we are talking about one Africa, that's exactly what we're talking about. That we can put all our African military uh, powers together. We also build our nuclear weapons together as Africa. And Africa can protect itself from America. Africa can protect itself from Germany, from England, from France, from Russia, and from China. But uh, we need to start learning because if they can do so to their own relatives in Ukraine, how much more can they do to black people whom they are not even related to? So I think it's a big warning sign to our African leaders that they must note that the first world countries, those that have military powers, will not stop at anything. And now we know the two, three top minerals that they are looking for is lithium, it is oil, it is uranium, and of course gold so that they can back up their economies with these things. And where do you find all these deposits? For sure, Sudan is one of the biggest deposits of oil. Mali is one of the biggest deposits of gold. Congo is one of the biggest deposits of, uh, of, 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 of lithium. And uh, some of these uh, chemicals and minerals they're using for making cell phones, technology is actually founded on these minerals. So as the appetite of technology is growing, the appetite of gadgets is also growing. And as they are building gadgets, they are also looking for minerals that build those gadgets. Ultimately, when they are done with Ukraine, uh, when they are done with Mali, when they are done with Ethiopia, uh, they are coming. They are coming for the Southern and Central Africa. So it's a warning sign. <laughs> somebody actually described it is somewhere like you know these superpowers or or these nations they just like um dogs <laughs> like dogs when you throw a piece of meat and you see everybody run there and they're going to tear that meat into you know into pieces and when they finish eating that meat then they start looking you know start looking so i mean it was critically described like if you look at what actually removed the Germans or the Europeans from the continent of Africa during the time of, of invading or slavery or colonization was because they had to come to defend their own territories at home. And that that could also be the scenario that we're seeing. And like you said, should be a warning to the leaders of the continent to understand that after this, you know, fighting of this bone is over, they will look back for fresh meat. I, I don't know. You, very true, very true, because we, we must understand also, even on our conversation for tonight, that we are having the conundrum of the African politician, that we, we, we forget that the African economy, and I'll, I'll be very specific, the African economy, that it is built as an economy that must supply raw materials, because they have built industries and manufacturing industries in their countries. So number one, they cannot tolerate the African countries building those industries. They want the third world countries to constantly supply, supply raw materials in minerals, in agriculture, and these they take into their countries and then they make the gadgets, whether they are cars or their cell phones, or it is clothing and textiles, or it is perfumes, or it is chocolates 
or it is anything. So if Africa, for example, begins to produce the chocolates, then it means that the factories in, in, in Belgium and the factories in France and the factories in, in Germany and England must close down because now the final product is coming out of Africa. And we're able, when we do that, to sell our products at the world market value. So we'll no longer be selling uh, lithium, but we'll be selling the cell phone batteries already made and processed. So China cannot say they are selling cell phones. You can make your software, you can make the hardware, but the battery, we are supplying it from Africa. That makes us a partner in the development of the global village. But until our African leaders understand the economy of the world, how it is structured around supply of raw material and then resell finished products to African countries, our leaders will think that they must plant more, they must dig more, they must do more, more of everything. And you don't need to do more because we can produce a little and the little we produce, if it comes out as raw, as raw material, we are losing money. But if it leaves the continent as finished products, from the little we are planting and the little we are mining, yeah. we are able to get maximum profit in return for our products. But right now, our African economy is stuck in raw material supply. And raw materials are always supplied in bulk. So when they come to Africa and they buy chrome, for example, or platinum, they won't tell you that inside platinum there is lead, inside platinum there is uranium, inside platinum there is gold, inside platinum there is chrome. They're only paying for platinum only. And all these other minerals that are inside the raw material, they benefit across the world. So it is cheaper for them to buy raw materials than to buy finished products. And as long as they are buying raw materials, the African economy will never compete with the Western economy. So I want to challenge African governments that start beneficiating, start processing your raw materials. Go to China, go to Germany as a country. Ghana, for example. Go and buy the machine that purifies the gold. South Africa. Buy the material and the machinery that processes platinum. Congo, buy the machinery that produces and processes batteries and lithium. So that at the end of the day, what you are sending out of your country are products, not raw material. This one you must remember for the rest of your life. As long as Africa is sending out raw materials, we are sending out jobs. We are sending out employment. We are sending out our economy. Because those materials, if they could be manufactured and processed in the African continent, the amount of jobs that we can create can actually make Africa a superpower within a space of less than 10 years. Because our economic power will be so vast and so felt around the world that money will start flowing to Africa. And that in mind speaks to one African economy. We need a central economy so that we can put our chrome, put our platinum, put our gold, put our coffee, put our cotton, put our manganese, put our iron, put our tin, put our asbestos, put our chrome, put our copper. All these materials if they are finding themselves on the world market in African stock exchange with the real value, which is similar to Japan, to New York, and to London stock exchange, it then means that the world economies must start investing also in the African economy. So the whole thing of African unity must not only be spoken, <coughs> spoken as a cosmetic conversation of we need unity, we need unity. We need to break it down. We need political unity. We need economic unity. We need cultural unity. We need language unity. We need academic unity. We need pharmaceutical unity. So that from all these confederations of unity, we can begin to put value on ourselves as Africans, 
and improve our economy. So right now, Africa is producing too much than it can consume. Because we are producing raw materials. We are not producing products. So we need production lines, clothing production, technology productions, military weapons productions, so that we can also begin to sell nuclear warheads to the rest of the world, as we also have some. If they give us trouble like North Korea, we can also point our nuclear weapons towards them. So we don't need to be scared as Africans. Right now, we are, we are, we are small boys on the global military stage because we don't have the military power to oppose the first world. I thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it is still a question of, is it out of ignorance or there's just something? Because like, when you say, you know, our leaders have to know, but if you look at our leaders, they are well learned and it's so experienced but per se. Um, so what is the question? What is the issue that I don't just want to do it or I don't know it? What is it? You think it's really ignorance? It's, it's in two ways. Firstly, the African leader who gets into power does not get into power from African money. He gets into power from European and American money. As a result, their allegiance is not to Africans. Their allegiance is to those that have put them into power. So when an African leader gets into power, before you say we have a new president, you must find out who sponsored him to become a president. Because the country that sponsored him to become a president will run your country and use him as a puppet president who will allow them to have access to raw materials. That's number one. Number two, many of our African leaders were not and are not educated in Africa. They are educated in Lisbon, in Frankfurt, in London, in New York, in California. So when they come back, you don't expect them to be Africans because you cannot send your children to Caesar and they don't come back as Romans. Wow. <laughs> you cannot send your children to Caesar and they don't come back like Romans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, so like you said, like coconut, isn't it? Is the, is the easiest part. They come back with high appetites of cognac. They like fine wines. They like <laughs> fine clothes. They like fine cars. They go to, they make money in Africa and then they fly to France and then they spend all the millions there. They fly to Italy, Milano, and they spend all the money there. They fly to New York and spend all the money there. So what do you expect? That's what they were taught when they in school, that when you succeed and you're successful, you must be driving this kind of a car, you must be dressing in this kind of clothes, you must be eating this kind of caviar, you must be sleeping on this kind of a bed. So many of our African leaders, their appetites are not African appetites. Their appetites are European and American appetites. At the end of the day, you actually find that African leaders are using African monies to buy European goods so that it can it can make them feel and look like the American, like the European they were studying in school. So we have not done well as Africans to say we have produced African leaders who are Africans in perception, Africans in appetite, Africans in thought, and African in behavior, and more so African in terms of their passion. For the, for the Africans. You, you see this even in the way in which they carry themselves, in the way in which they behave. They want to behave like, like, like European presidents. And you're an African leader. You need to understand where you are functioning from. But no, they are now custodians of the European 
system using the African economy to feed the European appetites. And their friends from school, their friends from uh, United Nations, their friends in the business community who they sympathize with them have access to the economy, access to raw materials, access to land, and the presidents become the doorkeepers who keep the Africans out of the economy and allow the Europeans, the colonialists, the Chinese to come actually and have a free party on our African continent at the expense of the local people. That too is a bad way of governance because it only means that the money that the leader is spending on himself is actually equivalent and enough to feed the country. Because a danger we have in some of the African countries is that the African leaders have viewed, dimmed, placed themselves as the chief custodians of the economy and they've converted the country's economy into a personal economy. I mean, you don't go very far to look at Mobuto Seseseko, to look at uh, some of the rascals that have gone through the African continent who, when they get into power, then they grab all the SOEs, the state-owned enterprises, and then they convert all those businesses into themselves. Look at Angola, uh, Savimbi and his daughter. Look at uh, Uganda, Museveni and his wife and his daughter. You, you, you begin to see a, repl a replication, a duplication of this family entitlement where one family wants to run the entire economy as if the whole country belongs to them. It is. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. Um, there, there's a lot we can chew out of this conversation, Dr. King Maponga Joshua. And I want to thank all of you that are joining this conversation. Um, I was looking at my blackboard and, and I keep seeing eight viewers. I like King Maponga is here and it's just eight. But then I had to refresh and see we are watching already close to 100 on this source and the other sources as many as possible. And so we can deeply get into the, the aspect of these conversations, you know. But before we go to that, you just saw me, I call him King Maponga Joshua Doctor. I didn't put Doctor first, so Doctor King Maponga Joshua. I want to break it a little bit to us to understand we never got to celebrate his honorary doctorate title and a lot of people were just like um yes these titles phds or what and i said no an honorary doctorate title like mine that has been honored by your people for your engagement and they freely give it to you it doesn't mean that we were lazy to sit and do the doctorate or whatever uh, but it, it, any honor that has been placed to you by your people is a merit that you deserve for your hard work. And not only that, it's the legacy that you have put the cornerstone. Now, why am I insisting on this, uh, uh, Dr. King Maponga? It's because you talked about the education of the colonialist that has actually put us in this place. And so the qualifications and the certifications and this P A H H H plus plus Ds that we have actually do not reflect, do not reflect the will of the people, that people honor you, that they award you, that they applaud you for your work. We take just fabrics, like you said. If we look at the Chinese, okay, it's still their brother or whatever from the other side. But if we look at just say the Indians, you look at them at all this world conference and everything they come like indians you don't even need to to say it they are indians from their fact from their dress code what is it that with african leaders that is always a mistake and i think while you're while you're on that i share my sincere uh, gratitude for the two honorary doctorates that i've been awarded uh, by two separate universities, the Sadiq University plus the uh, Methodist University in South Africa. And it's a recognition 
for the amount of work that we have put into the community for the development of the community. And for that, we are truly thankful and uh, truly grateful to this uh, kind of accolades of, of, of honor. And I think in a long, uh, long, long story short, cutting the long story short, um, true leadership uh, is one thing what one does for themselves. It's another thing what the community uh, does for you. It's another thing what the uh, country and the world uh, does for you in terms of recognition. And with that, I would not want to undermine or underestimate this uh, grand honor that they have conferred upon 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 me and many others it it only goes a long way to say we celebrate each other we rejoice with each other we recognize each other <clears throat> in the western world and in the in the northern world they do similar things where they also recognize each other they appreciate each other even the nobel peace prizes which is now almost acting like a one of the biggest achievements, any socialite, philanthropist, scientist, or politician can seek to achieve, which is the Nobel Peace Prize. It only says we actually recognize as the world what we have done. So I think it's high time also as Africans that we create our own uh, Nobel Peace Prizes. I don't know what we are going to call them, whether we're going to call them Sankara Prizes or we are going to call them Lumumba prices. We are going to call them Nkrumah uh, prices. Or we are going to call them Magufuli prices. It, the, the list is endless. So we can call them uh, Queen uh, Latiti or Nandi or uh, Akuo. That's, that, to me, that's immaterial. But what we need to know is, as Africans, we need to start recognizing each other and recognizing each other meaningfully. Meaningfully. Because as Africans, we cannot be gunning and aspiring for European recognition. And fellow Africans, and we are not recognizing each other in a good fashion. And I think that we can maybe, even under your leadership, uh, Dr. Susan, we can come up with maybe six or seven um, uh, uh, trophies. Uh, one for education, one for politics, one for medicine, one for agriculture, one for entertainment, one for culture and, and one maybe for religion and social issues. And we create these, these accolades. And once every year, we identify African leaders who, whom we think deserve some of these accolades. I'm even thinking on top of my head, we needed to recognize our co-founders, uh, the Nyereres, the Kwames, the Sinkaras, the Magufulis, the Mugabes, and the Winnie Mandela's and, and, and many others who have actually been able to be pathfinders on this great African journey. They have mapped the path for us as, as we are following. We are not walking in the jungle. We are following in the footsteps of those that have actually gone ahead of us. And no one will recognize them. The Americans will not recognize them. The Europeans and the Chinese will not recognize them. So it is time that as Africans, we can also begin to to recognize ourselves, appreciate each other, and honor each other in, in such a fashion. I thank you. Absolutely. Um, particularly this idea of, like you saying, Nobel, whatever, um, a prizes. And <laughs> for now, we had, like what you described, we actually were in the web, still under the web. But I think now that the awakening is coming up, that's the reason we need to question a lot. Like Professor Baena Bello said last time, we need to question everything you want to celebrate, everything that you even were given, question it. Question it, do a lot of research. What does this actually mean? What are even the hidden meanings that we don't even know about it? And question and question and question a lot. In terms of these honorary titles, entitlement, qualification, or awards that you have, we truly want to congratulate you. And really, we're still going to celebrate this. Why? Because like honoring ourselves is the only gift that we can give to each other. I mean, if you receive two in a in a in a in a, in a not share, you know, from two different institutes, that is the, the the free will of your work and your engagement. Yes, and I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, 
And we're coming to that stage of renaissance. The year of renaissance is now. So we're going back to, to all this stuff, isn't it? Yes. And uh, that, that I think also begins to rewrite a, a new narrative that says true knowledge and true education is not only found from the academic desks, which has the university, the single mono mono direction kind of thinking, which many of our universities are propagating. We need to start talking of multi-versity, multi-versity instead of university, because university speaks of a Hellenistic uh, academic pursuit, which is British, Italian, and Greco Hellenistic Roman, where you go to a school to regurgitate what the professor is saying and then recite what other professors have said. Then you're given a doctorate. Thank you very much. You're now a doctor because you know what Saiche said. You know what Butman said. You know what, um, what uh, uh, you know, uh, Samuel Bakioki or Gerhard Hazel and other professors have said. And that settles it for them. You can quote Plato, St. Augustine and Herodotus and you are an educated person. Whereas if you look around our own villages, if a grandmother has been able to deliver 50, 60, 100 children as a midwife, and she has done so successfully for 100 patients with no failure, she has gone in and come out with a baby every time, gone in, come out with a baby. She can count in the village, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. And we have prepared as Western, Western colonized women to pay 20, 30, 40,000 euros to go and get your stomach cut by a doctor. And here is an old woman who has done a hundred. Why can't we pay her? Maybe let's start there. Why can't we recognize the effort and the same amount of money you are prepared to pay in a hospital to get your child delivered with a knife why not pay the old woman who can also do the same job delivering with her hands and when you look at her is this not a gynecologist because she can work from a bridge birth to a straight birth she can work even to the operation itself if the birth canal is small she can cut and she has enough of her traditional herbs to heal the wound and cover up she can tie up the woman's stomach and restore her to her original shape. She actually does more than what a normal uh, academic doctor can do. And here we are, we still don't recognize these old women because they can't speak French, they can't speak German, they can't speak English. They remain only as traditional doctors. You know, traditional. You even, you even hear the word. It, it is unconventional. It is traditional. But don't worry about the unconventional part. Look at the results of the work that she's doing. She's a pharmacist. <laughs> she knows the herbs. She is a gynecologist. She knows the anatomy. She is a she's a, a, a doctor. She can check the temperatures and see if the woman is in stress and the baby is in stress. She can actually even help to change the, the, the direction of the baby who is in a bridge at first. The, Tell me she's a physiotherapist. She, and, and why would we find it difficult to honor such a woman with a qualification of, of a doctor? Because what she's doing is what the other doctor is doing. It's only that the other one is doing it under lights and this one is doing it under candlelight. <laughs> My king, if we have, uh, not, I'm not saying if we have to, we need to start it. We, we, I don't even know where every African, particularly our mothers and the local ones, when I say the local ones in the in our communities, our compounds and our villages, because I grew up there and I saw those children in my face being delivered to mothers that today will say they are illiterate, they've never been to school and they use just palm wine, palm oil, sorry, palm oil, and they use just peppermint leaf to disinfect their hands, right? They knew everything that they had to disinfect. They knew that they had to oil the baby with palm oil. 
They knew that they had to put, you know, just massage their mother. Everything was done when we were all babies. So if we really, it's not a matter of we, it's something as a matter of fact that we have to start. Look at how many inventions have been done. And when we don't say these are inventors, and we always will look at other people. So that's why we say the renaissance is here. But maybe we will need to do something to explode this renaissance. And I have good news, my king, because Senegal is inviting us at the monument of renaissance to do the renaissance 2022 Africa festival under that monument of family, you know, the monument of the renaissance. We've been lectured about that thousands of times. And it's going to be in December. It's already confirmed. And the concept is exactly what you're saying. How were we living before? It's not just festival where we go dance, music, and everything. No. How were we before? Before we became now pre-colonial history presentation in everything from fabrics to kitchen to everything. I am passionate about this for some reason or the other, because I was born in a village. I was born in a, in a hut. I was not born in a hospital. I was born in, a, in my grandmother's round hut with the floor that had cow dung on it. And uh, I, 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 I want to see something. If we can begin to give birth to children as Africans that are vaccination free, I want to see something if we can give birth to children that go back to breastfeeding. I want to see something with children that are going to eat organic food. And I want to see something if we can give birth to African children in and out. I want to hear those children talking. I want to hear their dreams. I want to hear their vision. Because this for me remains as the true nature of what the African is all about. And, and many of us, we think that by being European, we're healthier. It's not true. Our grandfathers and forefathers were not vaccinated. They lived past 100, 110, 120 years. Some of them are still alive as we speak. So I have a question for you. If we measure civilization on the basis of mortality, and the old people used to live longer than us, now we are dying at 50. We are dying at 60. We are, if we make it to 70 or 80, you are lucky. So if can we say that civilization increases mortality or civilization is now reducing mortality? Because what we have now are medicines that maintain diseases. We don't have a health system that prolongs life. So there's a big difference right there. When you have a disease... Here is something to help you to manage the disease. But we don't have a lifestyle that actually prolongs and elongates our lives. So I can say as a fact that our civilization is not, comparatively speaking, equal to our mortality rate. The more educated we are, the shorter our lives are becoming. The more traditional we are, the more uncivilized we are, the longer our lifespans and the vitality of life is, the more raw the food is, the better is the health. The more refined and sweet the food is, the less the quality of life. So when you look at it from a wholesome space, we can categorically state that we are getting more educated, but we are getting more and more unhealthy. Hmm. Um, very correct we, 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 we've been singing this all the time like go back to the village go back to the compounds strategy and then we would see who is truly civilized and who is because when we really just open us but, uh, that's why most of the time we're saying the diaspora go home the diaspora come home get that experience Go to the village, go to the compound. If you want to do your research to know about culture and identity, it's not in any university on the continent. It is in the villages and in the compounds. That is when you understand. That's where you really know. But 
I don't know how, how how much we can say it again, my king. No, we don't we don't need to emphasize those that have ears, I think they can hear. I would wish we can move over to the subject of the day where we are beginning to speak of our political conundrum uh, as it is panning itself out. Because what we are discussing right now is controlled by the politics of the day. Because now you have the Minister of Health, and the Minister of Health says, if a child must be born, a child must be vaccinated for polio, for measles, for hepatitis, for what, what. It's a government law. And if you don't do that, you will be arrested. So we already have a system at the bottom that is managing parenting. That even when you give birth to your child, they cannot give you back your placenta. They can't give you back the umbilical cord because it is considered as medical waste, which the doctors are taking. and They're making facial creams, they're making stem cells, and they're making tablets, and they're making medicines out of that. And we as Africans, we always knew that this placenta actually contains the stem cells. If a child has a problem with a skin disease, then they'll take this and boil it and bath the child. If the child has chronic problems inside, they'll make some fusions and make the child drink the thing And because it already contains the, the generic original DNA that a child used when they were in their mother's womb. At the end of the day, this science is not new to us. We are not new to stem cells. We have been working with stem cells as Africans for the longest of time. For the longest of time. But so already we already have a political system that introduces an educational system, introduces a health system, introduces a governance system, introduces all these, all these traps and nets into this spider web where the African leader simply gets himself stuck on this web. And when he is a leader and he's sitting in his office, he has nothing to do but to make sure that all these various ministries and all these various policies are being implemented. So we've already started talking about health, and health is already a threat. So colonialism is not only colonialism, it's a big word. Our health has been colonized. Our diet has been colonized. Our fashion has been colonized. Our religion and spirituality has been colonized. Our politics has been colonized. So, so the, the colonization, even our culture, has been colonized. So if we are saying we are free, we now have independence. The question I have for you, you are free from what? <laughs> you are free from what? Because you still send your children to the same Romans, to the same Caesar. You still get your children cut up by the same Caesar. And unfortunately, they, all call, they also call it the Caesar section. I don't know whether it is by accident or what. They all also call it the C-section. It is the C-section, the Caesarian section. So this is the Caesar section. We, we, we still have colonial medicines. We still have colonial entertainment and education and colonial sports, by the way. So if you say you are free as an African, I want to ask you as Africans, you are free from what? <laughs> because as far as I look at you, you have what might seem like it is political freedom, but it does not come with cultural, economic, health, social, academic, entertainment, spirituality, independence. In fact, your own presidents are being inaugurated by the same religious system, colonialists. They are still carrying those big knob carries, which is the British Queen's stick, in your parliaments. They are still putting on those stupid wigs in your courts. And you're free from what, as Africans? If I can be very honest with you, your freedom that you're talking about is freedom from what? We want to hear him. The volume is out. Can you hear me, Dr. King yes, Maponga? Yes, I can hear Oh, you. okay. Okay. Because I, I, I couldn't just like, yes, let's get into the topic like, we've, 
actually freedom from what? That's the question. Freedom for what? And um, um, how do we go about that? The web of colonization and African politicians dilemma. That's the topic for today. And I've, we've just already been brushing around the corner to open up, like we say, to open up the, the door so that when we speak these things out, you know, we could actually understand. So over to you, my king. I mean, we I'm, I'm so like eager. I, I wish I wish we can have a short little conversation. I will not make it very lengthy. I want to yes. keep it as, as precise as possible so that we can we can be able to put our minds around it. The, the, the colonial system that we find ourselves in, which has gone on for the past 400 years, from the time of the slave trade to the time of the colonization of Africa, which has become more evident in the past 100 years. And of course, in the past 60 to 70 years, we have begun to see, we begin to see the African countries getting independent with uh, Nigeria, with uh, Ghana being the first one and uh, the rest of the African countries following suit. Uh, we needed then to stop as Africans and consider the, the, the reality as it is beginning to pan itself out. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying so from a position of, of knowledge that we have 70 years of research, 70 years of observation, 70 years of hist history writing itself from Ghana to Kenya, to Tanzania, to Zambia, to Malawi, to Mozambique, to Zimbabwe, to, to Namibia, to South Africa, to, the list goes on, to Nigeria, to Sierra Leone, to Liberia. And when you look at all these 52 or 53 or 54 African countries, as each one of them is getting independent, as each one of them is getting liberated, as each one of them is gaining its own freedom from the colonial system, the question I ask again is, have they really been free? Have they really been freed? Do they understand what freedom is all about? And how do they begin to experience their freedom at the benefit of their people? Having said that, we needed therefore to be truthful to the fact that maybe as Africans, we have not put our heads fully around the colonial system so that one, we can understand the strength of the chains that bind us psychologically, politically, and academically, socially, and otherwise. Because by thinking that we are free, psychologically, we are still bound. When Bob Mali said, free yourself from mental slavery, I am glad he said that. He didn't say free yourself from physical slavery. He was very clear in his words. He says, free yourselves from mental slavery. Because the real freedom we're looking for is mental freedom. Mm -hmm. And mental freedom comes with us beginning to appreciate ourselves and understand that if we are to decolonize the African, his religion, decolonize his food, decolonize his medicine, his religion, decolonize his politics and his economics. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means, therefore, that the African must have his own bank to keep his own money. The African mm -hmm. must have his own industry to manufacture his own products. The African mm -hmm. must have his own sports to celebrate his own history. The African must have his own clothes to remember where he's coming from. The African must have his own education, which teaches them about themselves. Therefore, our freedom as we have it right now is a cosmetic freedom, which only speaks of putting an X in a ballot. Immediately after putting an X in a ballot, land remains unspoken. 
education remains unspoken. Fashion remains unspoken. Medicine remains unspoken. Things continue. And all these things are of economic value to the colonial system. The African leader who thinks he is in power but does not understand or appreciate his people and understand the colonial damage that has been caused on the African will go to parliament and put ribbons on a dead donkey hoping that it won't smell. Hmm. Wow. Um, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. I think this is a kind of a delay on our part. It's it's but obvious because you're talking and it's making a lot of sense. Like, I mean, when have we ever really seen any uh, any of the leadership or the leaders, like you say, being in power with no power? As a matter of fact, you're just being in power and you do PowerPoint presentations with no power in them. So where if now they're going to always create some kind of crazy world agendas. It is either, um, how do they call it? I don't really, you know, water or some kind of nature. Or, but there's never been an agenda where, I mean, politicians or leaders will sit and say, let's talk about our culture. Like you're saying, let's talk about our language. Particularly, my king, if you think we cannot even have a currency, a currency that we produce, it was better that we go to our trade by butter. I bring you this, you give me this. We know medium of exchange, isn't it? How can we even not be dependent when we don't have a single currency? How do we trade? The, the, the economy that you are you are addressing becomes the the key one of the key pillars in what we might want to call our freedom as Africans, because the fact that the white men walked out of the parliament does not mean that he walked out of the bank. Does not mean yes. that he walked out of the economy. They simply left you in parliaments. And by the way, a group of cattle, we call it a head of cattle. Yeah? And a group of chickens, we call it a flock of chickens. But a group of monkeys, we call it a parliament of monkeys. <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's English now. And it is clear when you walk up into any one of our parliaments that they've really become a parliament of monkeys where people just walk into parliament to shout, to curse, to swear at each other. And there's no dignity in some of these parliaments. Uh, by nature, we, they are foreign to us as Africans that young boys and girls can be swearing and cursing and their own fathers in the name of democracy. So yes, the economic issue becomes critical because the economy informs the politics. Economy buys politicians. Uh, money buys politics. Politics is almost like prostitution. People, you go to the highest bidder. At the end of the day, whoever sponsors a political party Whoever sponsors a political regime has the authority to dictate the political, social, and economic policies when a leader that they have chosen gets into power. At the end of the day, therefore, let's agree that many of our political leaders are not African political leaders, but they are surrogate governments who have been sponsored by the colonialists to become custodians of the economy to the benefit of the colonial system. So if you look at it very closely, the real war is not political war. The real war is economic war. Think about it. Why are they so interested in Africa? Was it not of our resources and our economies? Are you telling me that the Europeans and the Americans are interested in our welfare. They are interested in our dignity. 
They are interested in our culture. They are interested in us as Africans. You must be smoking. You must be smoking. They have no interest in the African as a person. The interest of the colonial system is simply an economic interest. Their interest is as clear as economics. Does this make economic sense? For example, the war in Congo. If the war should stop in Congo, does it make economic sense to Belgium, to England, to America? The answer is it does not make economic sense because it means that the resources and materials they are stealing out of Congo as we speak right now. Aeroplanes are flying in and out of Congo with minerals. They've created land strips in the jungles of Congo <clears throat> to steal minerals into China, into Europe, and into America. So if you ask the question, does the liberation of Congo make economic sense? The answer is simple. If the war stops, business stops. So it does not make economic sense. The, economic can, the economy can only be as viable as war is continuous. So the first thing we need to understand is Africans, particularly opposition parties that are filling up Africa in the name of democracy and local people start fighting each other over political parties. Ask yourself the question, who is sponsoring these political parties? Because if you can identify the sponsor, you can identify the leader. So many of our African leaders are in power but they are not in control. Absolute. No way, no way. So, so, but is it true, um, uh, like questions that are coming in to say, even the war is a continent of destruction because the war is just to, you know, destabilize people running health, uh, health to skater where they are busy looting. So actually, it's just a distraction. Could it could it be considered in that sense? But you, who is at war with them? So probably the leaderships, they also know that this war is not really um, a, a war like we think, uh, create some narratives and come to enter war. I mean, how, how does it even concern you when these leaders don't people well and it becomes the problem that you have to intervene? The, the militarized government is very convenient for dictatorship and anarchy because then the, it means that the, the military is in control of movement of people. And strategically so, you even saw it during the COVID pandemic, that many of our African governments resorted to, and even European governments, resorted to the military to put and enforce law and order. And this becomes a democratic war where people's freedom is taken away from them and the military bases, the military generals are running those countries. So you ask yourself the question, is the military there to protect people from outsiders or the military is there to protect the leader from his people or the military is there to protect people from themselves? <laughs> At the end of the day, who are you protecting? When you are beating up your own citizens on the streets, who are you protecting? You are supposed to be protecting the people and you end up using your guns to fight, to destroy, to kill your people. Then what is militarization except that it begins to serve a personal, local, and international 
interests. And in the state of COVID, we know very well that the military powers were used to enforce the military and vaccination and peace and order during the times of unrest. Therefore, when you militarize a country, you start breeding dictatorships. Um, how time do Africans, even just the leadership, I mean like opposition and others, how much more do would they want to learn to end that? Whatever situation and problems that are going on on the continent, a cry foul play and call all oh, the international community is now listening, the international community act and the international community doesn't act or react. Never would they act if it was not coming something that would be of their interest. If it's only coming to serve you, if only coming to protect you so that you're not beaten, you're not military you're not incarcerated they, they don't so much more how does it take for us as Africans to understand that no concern and attitude to whatever would ever save this continent apart from us as Africans you know look at the wars like you're saying riots everywhere everywhere and particularly the there's something that we, it has to be nation building, working together. If you look at all the elements that were ripped or were stolen, as they say, and the opposition or the youth flew the street, they are killed, they are incarcerated, they are decapitated, and they keep thinking, oh, yeah, because we, when we do that, when we riot and shout, the, the, the United Nations, the international is going to listen of them are rotting they are dying in the cells and nobody cares when we will listen to understand that these instruments have never been working and they will in the interest of the africans it's painful uh, doctor very very painful because when our children go to academic institutions of higher learning and they do their undergraduates and they do their graduate studies and they get all constipated with this seemingly democratic uh, politics you know freedom to speak what you want freedom to freedom to and all this baggage of freedoms then they come back into their into their countries and they don't appreciate the history of where we are coming from as far as they are concerned, they don't want Africa to become Africa. They want Africa to become New York. Because that's where they were studying their masters. They want Africa to become London. They want Africa to become Sydney. And the question is, when your appetites for colonial institutions supersede your appreciation of your African institutions, the academic person becomes an abuser of the fellow African. Because for argument's sake, mm -hmm. you go back into the village. Who said the old woman in the village wants a TV? Who said she wants a house that is painted, that is a four-roomed house with corrugated roof? Mm -hmm. Have we stopped is modern young people to ask the old people what is it that they really want? What is it that they want? Some of them and some of us, we want our lives as indigenous, as original, as possibly we can with a few gadgets here and there to make us access the world and access certain amenities but not all of us want to live in a concrete house. Not all of us want to live in a modern Eurocentric perception. But our young people, they think that this is what we want. So we are also looking, number one, when the young people are beginning to abuse the old people by forcing on them the technologies and the civilizations that they've gathered in the Western education system.
The other adverse of that is when the old people also refuse to give the young people a bit of what they want. But the real political conversation takes place where the old people and the young people can sit around together and the old people can say, we don't want this changed. The young people say, we want this changed. And then we say, what is the middle ground where you can have a little bit of what you want? We can also have a little bit of what we want. For me, that, is becomes, that becomes a healthy democracy where one system that thinks itself more educated than the other abuses the other that thinks it's less educated. And when one system that is older than the other thinks it can suppress and oppress those that are younger than itself. But as old people as we are, we have become custodians of our culture, of our traditions, and we feel at a greater level if we should let go our culture into the hands of the young boys and girls who are coming with opposition parties, excited about technology, excited about everything that is happening in the West, this could actually be the last time we see ourselves as Africans. Because now we are proud that our children cannot speak our own languages. My daughter does not speak any Swahili. They only speak English. My child does not speak Shona or Ndevele or Igbo. They only speak French. My daughter does not. They only speak. And our measuring, of our, when we measure our success, we measure it by how less of an African you have become. No, they no longer eat these traditional foods. They only eat cornflakes and they eat wheat bix. They cannot eat the traditional porridges. And the parent is happy and excited that their children have actually become like white children. So when you look at this conundrum, where the old people are saying, let's keep a little bit to ourselves. And the young people are saying, to hell with everything that is old. Let's make everything new. This begins to create the political tensions in the African countries where young people want to disappear from their culture and old people want to preserve their culture. So I want to say that education in some certain instances has become a passport an escape passport of the African from his culture to the colonial culture. And when the African comes back to his own villages, he becomes irrelevant because the information and the culture and the socializing that he or she now has is totally irrelevant to the environment that brought them into being. Is it not funny that those very same edu uneducated parents were able to send you to school those very same uneducated parents were able to educate you. But when you come back from your education, you can no longer relate to them. They are backward. They are uncivilized. They are uneducated. And you would want to do everything in your power to make sure that with your education, you redeem them. You redeem them from their culture and you make them white. So how do we know that? The day when you are going to get married. There you are with your new French girlfriend or Russian girlfriend or British girlfriend or educated girlfriend. Now you want to get married in an exclusive hotel, white garments, white clothes. You want to put on some rings. You want a function that celebrates what you have been seeing on TV. And anything that has to do with your culture becomes totally irrelevant. So can we say, I come back again, can we blame ourselves when we send our children to Caesar and they come back as Romans? <laughs> it's not funny at all, even though I, I laugh in, a, in another context because it's... Uh... Even the culture that we're talking about, Dr. King Maponga, we still need a lot of work to work on that culture. I know the space where you're coming from. But if you look at generally, because the impact, like you're saying, the impact of the web of colonization, if you look at our belief systems, our marriage systems, our customs, 
our food culture, our, um, what do I say, community culture. Uh, if, if you look at even this word tempered, if I, I take an example, it, the consciousness of the diaspora, the African Americans, the Caribbeans, a conscious community who have researched their history know so much and they're more conscious of being African Africans than Africans on the continent. Today you see the, the, the celebration, and that's a conflict right there, like, like what you're saying. They are walking and they even on the continent, just because we're on the continent, we wear these colorful clothes, but we still go to worship and pray to gods that are not our own. We still don't even know what our culture means. We're so oriented, oriented into the Western cont uh, culture on the continent. Oh my God, it, it's crazy, just crazy. So this melange or this middle point where you where would where do we actually start? Where, where do we start? What, what, what you're sorry, saying, we, we what you're saying is is very 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 interesting because for me it it it, it underpins the entire conversation. What you're saying is very critical and very very important. Why do I outline that? Because had we been colonized by the Chinese, we all right now would have been Buddhists. It's a fact. Had yes. we been colonized by the Muslims, we all would have been Muslims. But that we were colonized by the Europeans. Is it correct that the African should say, I am a Christian? No, I beg to differ. You are not a Christian. And you will never be a Christian. The correct statement must be, I was colonized by Christians. And I took the God of my master. And he has now become my God also. I took the religion of my colonialist. And now I also worship the same God with my colonial master. So this is a master, slave, master, servant relationship at an economic level, which now spills over into a spiritual level. So there's no Christian, no African who can call themselves, I am a Christian. There's no African who can say, I am a Muslim. There's no African who can say, I am a Buddhist. Just say it clearly. I was colonized by, and they made me to be, to believe the same God they <laughs> believed in. So we have a problem, particularly myself. I have a problem with Jesus. Because if we become Christians, therefore we must also address Jesus who allowed the colonialists to colonize us, abuse us, rape us, steal from us, kill us. And it was all part of his will to destroy us. <laughs> <laughs> it is um it, it sounds you you know i i like this kind of conversation because it, it doesn't only you know it's it's a two-way like we're talking to ourselves at the same thing i just want to give a clear example it is only yesterday and we saw all sort of hearts and loves and cards and, and presents and this in the name of St. Valentine's Day. Just yesterday. Okay. Right. I, I talked about it and I said, and I like that, what you're saying, because we're in the middle. We're coming in the middle to actually start formulating how it should work. Because in the beginning, when we just say, oh, we're not celebrating St. Valentine's Day we don't celebrate we don't celebrate even black history month is also questionable oh we don't celebrate this we don't celebrate you know we really truly don't understand so we sat in the team and said 
said, okay, it's fine. The recent Valentine's Day, we have nothing against that. But is that the African day? No. Let us address it clearly. And we sent a card and say, for us Africans, we celebrate love. When if they say is the is the is the feast of love, four seven three hundred and sixty five days is Ubuntu. But of course, because the Europeans are celebrating their feast of Valentine, we also so them a happy Valentine's Day as they do break. So we have nothing against the holiday that they celebrate, but this holiday is not my own. But I wish you, and if I want to celebrate even, I'm celebrating your holiday and nothing wrong with it. For me, that is a universal celebration. It's a cult. And it's a, it's, I mean, that was the impression of the project when we walk that project, it lies truly in the communication, my king. Just like you're saying. What any, if not all, and every civilization that has matured, it must own its time. It must own its festivals. It must own its celebrations. Because the culture and cultural celebration is engraved and embodied in time. Therefore, the African calendar, and I'm going to recommend again that we look for Mukulu Singiswa, who has done a committee Mkulu calendar Singh. for Africa. Um, yes, and, uh, I'm right. I'll, 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 give you, I'll give you the details. I'll give you the details. Thank you. Because with, with, with that, we're able to own our time and say when is what and what are we doing at such and such a time that speaks to our seasons uh, as africans a season for plowing a season for harvesting a season for preparing ground a season for seed a season for this and all these are linked up to the moons they're linked up to the weather patterns and we have particular celebrations as we go along now you have this uh, valentines you have this easter you have this crazy woman also they call Christmas and her sister called Easter and the brother called Valentine's. And every year Christmas is looking for a new husband. And someone wrote me a message and says, Merry Christmas. And I said, I don't want to marry her. Marry her yourself. Because last year she was she was also calling for Merry Merry, Merry Christmas. It says, what did she do with her husband last year? Because this year she's looking for a new husband. So my, my two cents worth is that maybe Christmas, if he is a boy, he must marry Easter and they must go on Valentine's. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never really... <laughs> They must go on a date, you know. <laughs> and it's also another crazy one coming up. Like, I mean, um, how on kind of audacity, my king, to be honest with you, what kind of unholy gods some people will see it somewhere and ask the African to celebrate a Black History Month? And out of the 20, 12 months that created. And then, uh, you know, it's even so crazy, like, celebrate black history. Black, his own story. Not your own story. Not our story. And, it, 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 and you begin to ask yourself, well, wait a minute. How? Once in a month. And we celebrate black history. Shouldn't we stop all this crazy kind of business? Every day. The, the, the Black History Month for me uh, speaks to the colonial system uh, giving the black person uh, a break. And I call that a colonial holiday for one reason more than one. It is that if we have a Black History Month, we also need a White History Month. We also need yes. a, an Indian History Month. We also need a Chinese history month. 
the very fact that a white man gives you a holiday to celebrate yourself already tells me that he's managing your system. He's managing your expression. And after the Black History Month, for a day in a year, you must go back to the colonial history because the colonialists have 364 days. You, as a black man, have one day in a year. So they have the whole year to themselves. And they give you one day a year where you can dress up as an African, eat up as an African, do everything as an African, immediately at sunset. Yeah, cock. Time up, time up, please. Back to work. Put away your African things. If you are going to give me a Black History Month, I will not take a Black History Month. I'll take a Black History Year. If you give me, if you give me a, a, a day, I would want a month. If you give me a month, I would want a year. And if you give me a year, I want a lifetime. Then it only means that the African must constantly and continuously be able to express themselves and not wait for colonial holidays that are short-lived in the midst of them managing us as to how must we express ourselves within a short limited space of time and after that please put away that rubbish now come back come back here come back and be what we have made you to be so it's all or nothing at all or even let's just even say we copy <laughs> i know when i say this my my your audience the family here is going to run after me I'm like dr susan you always say we copy no it's not about that it, it's about also alternative now we do know yes the europeans they're very okay to say we are celebrating our valentine's day we make profit we create heart we create, we invite people for dinner we dress red you know we hold room they celebrated our gift and everything is a symbol of love because everything has a, a pattern now good for them and it, it, so it's also possible we're going to put ubuntu day yeah and then we also consume give ourselves african gift do african profit sell african things and then ask the world to join us celebrating these days our african things you know creativity innovation um so if there is a christmas we have the the spirituality day and we also our praise our libations with our whatever and invite the world to celebrate this our faith, like the hindus they do just like every other so you think it's because but also creating our own alternate, our own systems. Instead of us blaming their systems, we just not creating our own. Um, some of the young people don't understand. I'm, I'm seeing one of the young boys here called uh, Ramez, who says I'm a stand-up comedian. You know, I know he's a, he's a Zimbabwean boy or a South African okay. boy who, 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 who seems who seems consumed with this coconut uh, mindset. What we don't understand, and some of these young boys who have been to school and they have memorized William Shakespeare and uh, they now can write their names in English. They forget that when you temper with people's culture, you are able to temper with their economy. Because these holidays are directly linked to economic stimuluses within a colonial system. You look at Valentine's, for example. You are able to sell cards. You are able to sell flowers. You are able to sell yeah. to sell perfumes. You are able. You are able. You are able. Of all those businesses that you are able to sell, how many of those are benefiting the African? You look at Easter. You are able to sell bunny eggs and up to now i still don't understand how a whole african can believe that a rabbit can give birth to eggs but that's a conversation for another day <laughs> you're able to buy these hot cross buns you're able to buy these uh, these these cakes you're able to buy and buy and buy so when you accept a colonial ideology on the left you must be prepared to support the ideology with your economy on the right you look at christmas it's one thing to accept and celebrate 
the birth of Jesus at Christmas. Once you begin to hear that music in the air, da la 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 it's playing in the shops. It's a frenzy for buying. Yeah. And if we don't understand as Africans that the colonial holidays are directly linked to the economy, because once we accept the holidays, we must now follow up and support those holidays with our hard end cash and buy the Christmas trees, buy the Easter bunny eggs, buy, buy, I think in the next three, four years, we may end up with Africans celebrating Halloween, Halloween, the ghosts and demons of the- Oh, it's already. European <laughs> witches as they are visiting our homes and etc. It will happen very soon with boys such as Ramez that is coming very soon, sooner than we expect. Because everything that is African is evil. And everything that is European is holy and is righteous. And all we need to do is take our money as Africans and walk up to the Europeans and support them in their holidays. Such boys don't even have a stop order of giving money to their own parents. They would rather spend money buying flowers for their girlfriends as if their girlfriends eat flowers. Now, when you understand the brainwash, the amount of brainwash that has gone on on the African child, you can only realize that the damage is not only psychological, it is emotional, it is spiritual, and ultimately, it is economic. Yeah, it is. It is. It, it, it is so like that. I mean, we know even, you know, our, our, our young sisters or girls that really would go on, on a war and even would cut it if they are not celebrated in that pattern. That's how damn now sick. You ask yourself, what has this, for God's sake, just got to do with love and the good times you spend together? So probably, yet yeah, also do see, like I said, our main issue, um, whether we disagree or not, will still fall back our disunity. Because we do have, um, I'm, I'm a custodian of that, we have our African festivals, cultural festivals for arts and culture. Believe me, the methods that we've been doing in Germany for the past, now what's the uh, 15th edition, um, and taking it over to Senegal this year, we have seen how much money that people have spent on these projects. You know, the exhibitors come with goods made in Africa. You know, uh, some of them also are still being copied in China and they just bring it. But you see European or the Africans buying and putting money here in the belief to say, I think something back to my culture, a product that is in my culture. So if we are united, it's a question, and we could create a global, week or month for Africa festivals of arts and culture. We have another year for business. We have another year for cross-cultural. We have everything because we are a, a continent of celebration and festivals. Our dead, or we're celebrating, we dance, we eat, we celebrate. So, but we don't have a unique one that unites all of us. Like when we're saying a unique one, Christmas is all over. How did they succeed to implant this vacation, this holidays, and connect us when we cannot come also with our own? And, and oh, then nobody is stopping us now. Unity is our solution, I think, uh, isn't it? We, we needed to also extend our conversation into appreciating that with the takeover of our culture, the ownership of our calendars and our time begins to talk to what we might call cultural uh, tourism, where yes. Africans can begin to move amongst each other, spending money on each other, spending our income on, I mean, I would love to come to, to G Gambia, for example, and visit the jungles of Gambia for the Bhiti ceremonies and write papers yes. around the cleansing of ceremonies in the jungles there. I would love to visit the Hottentots down in Congo Basin 
and understand the ways of the past. I, I've been with the with the with the Koi and the Sang in the Kalahari and in Swakopmund in Namibia. Uh, I would love to see Madagascar, the traditional and indigenous healers that are there. I would love to visit yes. Senegal and understand also their culture. So, so for me, it, it, once we begin to appreciate ourselves as Africans, both in terms of textile and industry, in terms of fashion, in terms of medicine, etc., there is so much that is happening in Africa that we can learn from each other. And we share notes and we share money from one country to another as we are exploiting ourselves. We can't wait for the Germans and then the Norwegians and the Swedish to be coming and seeing our own African cultures where we are. And we are busy in yeah. each other as Africans and we can never spend money on each other. Therefore, we must understand that the preservation mm -hmm. of culture also comes with an economic stimuli of what I might want to term cultural tourism which then empowers the Africans to begin to spend our money on each other in terms of continental tourism. Um, imagine, imagine, it's not even just a matter of thing, just if it's a cultural history. Because to be honest with you, the, ever since Berlin chopped us into 50, it, it, since 1884, and that's why we keep... We can hold that conversation, we can argue, but we will have to hold a Berlin conference. Whether we like it, we will have to do that. Um, because we have to dis dislocate that spirit of division where it started, where it was planted. I don't bother how many people, how many kings, how many leaders, how many um, uh, organization representatives put me, but they have the a declaration on that denouncing that is the thing. So, because they chopped us, we don't even know our neighboring country. Nothing. Like you say, Zimbabwe never been there. Saki have never been there. And I've never been there. Nigeria have never been there. Just imagine only taking that tour for three visiting or even six months. Just once in it will change the whole whole history we're talking about 2063 and, and and again if we if we understood that we we in africa have more uh, tourist attractions possibly than many other european countries and chinese countries out there i mean the serengeti on its own the kruger national park the wangi national park the victoria yes. falls the great congo rivers the cultural exchange programs, the beaches of Africa from Mombasa to Zanzibar to Lorenzo Max to Mozambique to Durban, mm -hmm. the Table Mountains. You begin to you begin to look at the wealth that Africa has. And as such, when you yes. travel to these places, you are able to see not only the tourist attraction issues, you are also able to see the economic opportunities that are available. Mm those areas yes how much construction is happening do they need cement do they need paint what kind of business am i doing will they need branding over here can i buy this material from here and export it over there can i bring my coffee from there and sell it over here can i take my Ankara dressings and all the Ghana and sell them down in the south what can i take from the south maybe take the jewelry and a bit of beading work and take it to the north so that the african continent begins to have a, an economic conversation amongst ourselves in terms of exchanging of ideas, exchanging of economy, exchanging even of political ideologies, and we begin to grow as a continent together to build the Africa that we want to see. I still want to be here another 40, 50 years from now and enjoy an Africa where I can host guests from... from uh, Liberia, guests from Congo, guests from Central Africa, from Burkina Faso, guests from Ethiopia, and I can also visit them, and they can also visit me. It is in this cultural exchange that Africa will truly recognize how rich she is with materials, with knowledge, and with resources. And for me, this is the dream of the Africa that I want to see where the African child can move from Cape to Cairo with no passport. Yes. 
and enjoy every bit of experience within <laughs> the continent and not feel to be feel marginalized excluded abused or insulted by another african because now we will understand when an african comes here right now like in south africa some africans feel when africans come here they're coming to take our jobs but at this kind of africa that i'm talking about when you see an african coming to your country you know that the african is coming to spend money in your country they are bringing blessings they are bringing resources they are bringing intelligence they are bringing materials they are bringing business opportunities and this free movement of africans will begin to develop a continental value system and we can brand our continent to become that epitome the real the real holiday destination of the world like the idea we spoke about at the beginning of midwives i look forward to a day when german and swedish women can actually come and have their children delivered in a traditional fashion in an african in an african midwifery clinic because to me that speaks of now our cultural exchange programs from our medicines to our fashion as we share with the world what we have as they also share with us what they have i call that mutual understanding global respect and continental integrity that for me becomes the african dream where what do you have what do we have what can we share it is it, it it's not we are just not dreaming dear family that is watching us we have a lot of professional nurses inside here my god but if you look, at, you look at Sinovia, you look at all of them, even the men that are here, we have just a lot of, of uh, I don't know, we, we always been blessed, even in our, in, in on, on, on the way, on the journey through slavery or through colonization, has always been so perfect to navigate its way. We have been so perfect our way. I heard one of the professors that were here said, ah, oh, you know, even I had to go with my, but we know how to walk in through our bushes. We will still cross to one other through the rivers. In my poem, some other time here, when we know our rivers, we know our, 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 our we would do our bushes and we would connect without driving on the roads, isn't it? Mm. The, the technologies, the technologies of the past, we're so interesting. I mean, even in the olden days, when you see chickens fighting, that was our that was our telegram and our cell phone. We knew that visitors yes. are coming. You know, we knew that visitors <laughs> are, are, are coming. And mark my words, it 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 would happen exactly like that. So we, there, there are these beautiful, beautiful sciences that made us uh, intelligent and sensitive to our natural environment where the, yes. the most recent of them that i can remember it is the, the, the tsunami the hurricane that uh, happened in them in the eastern places there is it japan or somewhere in the east there where they say that the animals started walking upland a few days a few weeks earlier the animals were running away from the sea and going up the mountains and the human beings were running to the beach. But it looks like the animals could sense that there was a trauma coming. There was a hurricane coming. And yes. they went to higher ground. Now, when, when an African loses touch with, with nature, which becomes our compass for life. For there is a time when these bushes were our pharmaceutical clinics. There's a time when, when these bushes where our agricultural space there's a time when these bushes where our graveyards and our shrines our worship temples but, but when we lose contact with nature i think we lose contact with the essence of our beings as africans because we are melanated people we are not europeans we are not chinese we are not americans we are africans and one factor that distinguishes us as Africans, 
it is our high sense of spirituality and our connection with nature. Mm. I share. Hmm. As a matter of to, I mean, just to break it down, uh, without nature, or nourish. I mean, we can never be some other people else. We need our bushes, we need rivers, we need particularly us. We need our animals. They are our eat our animals. We don't zoo them. We don't cage them. We don't walk them to go and say we love animals more than we just leave them free. I grew with cats and, and dogs. It, that not, one, not they just go and come when they want. We were is like just space. <laughs> is it not funny that colonialism restricts us not to have access? To our rivers not to have access to our forests not to have access to our mountains now there's a white man who owns that land and he puts a big fence trespassers would be prosecuted because these are the very centers that gave the african access to his spirituality and colonialism mm -hmm. also removes blocks inhibits the african from having access to these natural resources we don't need land only for agriculture we also need it for spirituality yes sure sure Wow. I mean, it's it, it, why can we, if you look at our pre colonial history, how free we could live. We didn't have to bother even to wear some kind of tight pants and, and, and some kind of crazy jacket. We didn't have to bother to whether we eat what. And we were just running around. We didn't even know whether nakedness was what. And today, um, they say we are nude. When we even press up, they say, oh, we are nude. Oh, we were showing this. And today, when a woman would want to dress the way they want, you see their brother, sister say, oh, you look like a prostitute because you're wearing a short skirt. Oh, and you ask if we only knew our pre-colonial history, how were we dressing it's, in Maponga? I saw you also, in one of your it's interviews. Also, <laughs> it's also interesting, very interesting to, to that you are bringing out that, that point. Because... If you on Facebook, for example, if you put a picture of Swazi or Zulu girls, yes, who are in their maiden clothes with bare breasts and etc., you will be blocked on Facebook. They will block you. But yes. if you post anything that is homosexual or anything that is pornographic, you you will survive. Isn't it funny that even the media space that we seem to be working on deliberately decides to segregate and undermine African culture and they deem it as pornography. But when they publish their own pornography, we must accept it. But our culture cannot be accepted. So we wonder who is sitting at the control board is it some white European pervert who, when he sees breasts, he sees sex? When an African, in the original sense, looks at breasts, he never saw them as sex objects, except that they were used for breastfeeding children. And, and, and now women cannot breastfeed in public. But you can eat in public. But a child can't eat in public. Because breasts will arouse the sexuality of a white man. You, these kind of cultures, they are subtle. They're, they're very subtle. And, 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 and very perverse in, in ideology. You would find that even some of these democratic rules they want to instill in African countries, they are simply intended to allow the Europeans and the Americans, when they come into our African countries, that they can abuse young girls, they can abuse young boys, and sleep with as many as they are because the democratic policy of that country will allow them to practice that. It's one of the key factors to writing out and accepting the democratic charter 
you must accept the human rights. And once you begin to speak of human rights, it's not human rights according to African culture. It is human rights according to American culture. And what an American is free to do in America, what a European is free to do in Europe, he must come and do it in Africa. On the adverse, what an African is free to do in Africa, he is not allowed to do it in America. He is not allowed to do it in Europe because it is deemed as barbaric, as profane, and promiscuity. Then you understand that this democratic system is a one-sided story, which is to empower, to enforce a colonial culture on the African child, and the African child can never practice his culture in his own country, number one, and in a foreign country. If you are living in town, for example, and you call your relatives together, and you go and collect a goat, and you want to kill a goat, and eat it in your house. The SPCA will come and arrest you. Why? You must go and buy the goat at a white man's butchery. Then it has been killed in a civilized way. You tell me, what is a civilized way of killing a goat if it is not cutting its throat? So, so the, the, this, 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 this cultural... This culture, this Western culture, which is hiding behind democracy. Our young people think that by becoming democratic, they are becoming free. But in the depth of that charter of democracy, you are giving up becoming an African. And you are saying, we would run our countries, we would run our homes, we would educate our children, we will hospitalize our children. We will deliver our children. We will rule ourselves with Western, European, and American rules instead of ruling, governing, eating our, our things as Africans. Therefore, I don't look at it from a very simplistic, simplistic platform. But when you look into the depth of it, the, the side effects of democracy have resulted this one you can hashtag. The African has become an endangered species. One principle of democracy. Take away the African from his culture. Plant him in the Western culture. Then we can be able to deal with him. But even in that state, he is never equal to us. For he comes here, not as a master, but he comes as a slave and a servant. My question again, on the globalization. When we finally walk into the global village, I'll constantly ask this question. What are we going to be as Africans in that village? Question number one. Question number two, who will be the king in that village? Question number three, what God will be in that village? Question number four, what religion will be practiced in that village? Question number five, what culture will manage that village? Question number six, how will the African leave his own culture in that global village? Does it have tolerance for Africans? Or by then, the African must be fully whitewashed so much that he hates, she hates herself. And every one of her, her children, boys and girls, all of them want to become as white as the colonial master is. Oh, there's no doubt about the fact that we have um, one thing to say again. And, and most of even the systems, King Maponga, um, when we go by ancient uh, prehistory, like we say pre-colonial history, because I think that's really the way we would always pre-colonial his history, our story. You're going to see that even the same sex or diversity, like uh, uh, President said, all the things that you are saying about, we had it and we have, we just don't promote it. What is it that we even promote in Africa? Talk less of, but why do you choose one particular thing that they have to? There's nothing new after all, civilization started where? 
in Africa. What is it that you can teach us? Nothing that you can teach us. You just pick in, even some of the things, recycling it and put your marketing and communication on it and make it propaganda. Apart from that, nothing new that we never did. Or not doing. Maybe as we are, as we are closing down, let's, uh, let, let's, let's agree that our, our greatest weakness are ourselves, the educated amongst ourselves. For we have become custodians of this colonial uh, system. And we think that our education is a passport to escape from our culture and ourselves. The, the education that we may deem to be education, it is actually a parasite of African education. We have said this in some of the programs, and I know my, my learned friend, uh, Dr. Small and my learned friend, may soul rest in peace, Dr. Rashid. They have gone to lengths to, and of course, Dr. Nsingiswa, they've gone to lengths to educate and try and remember. You know, I like that word, is remember. You know, you're putting the members together. You're realigning the members to remind the African that our technology, our civilization, and our science, the alchemy, remains, remains supra to all colonial educational systems. The R, the gap, the Ra, which you now call algebra, it's actually an Egyptian R, gap, and Ra. Those are gods in the Egyptian space, which you now call algebra. Chemist comes, comes from alchemy and chemitic, chemit, which is Egyptian. But again, when the history is written by the colonizer, it will never glorify the colonized. We study our history from the time the European colonizes us. We don't start and study our history from where we begin as a people, from Nelubale to Rinzuri to Embo, the hunters and the gatherers, the Bushmen, the Aborigines, and the Hottentots, the Masons, builders of the great pyramids of Giza, Sudan, Nigeria, and Zimbabwe, the farmers and the gatherers. And we study our history from an honest platform of understanding what is embo, what is the embroidery of African tapestry, what is, what is it that puts us as African together. What, and by the way, white people are not Bantu. They are not the children of Ntu. They are not Bantu. We are Bantu. <laughs> we are people. We are melanated people with the with, with a genesis, an embryo, an embo, where we all started from. And understanding ourselves, therefore, and studying ourselves, writing about ourselves, speaking about ourselves, reasserting ourselves. Why is it that the world is scared of the African who knows themselves? <laughs> what is it that scares a white man, when a black man stands up, a black woman stands up and says, I am black, beautiful, and powerful. What is it that scares the world? Because when an African stands to recognize themselves, they may just tell the European who he is. <laughs> who he is. And they have not acted in Buntu. They have not acted as Bantu. Because Ubuntu, a person, without Ubuntu, character, is into a thing. Therefore, we as Africans, Abantu, people, Sinobuntu, which is character. And without character, we become into things. What makes us human is our 
Instead. That when you see a fellow black person, similar melanin, like yourself, you say, here is my brother, and here is my sister. And that puts us together as a nation. Different languages, different dialects, but we are all connected, for we are children of Ntu. For that reason, Singabantu, Tiribano, Vano Hunu, Kanadisna Hunu, Tirijino. We pride ourselves as Africans that we are the children of Ntu. Ba Ntu. I thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, King Maponga. I mean, the uh, I don't know the, the 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 stream is just acting too much on our on our side. There's some blackouts. There's some coloring. There's some delays. There's some. So it it really has not been on on the way. Uh, um, it would have been. I think it it might have caused some distractions out there. But one thing that I know is you have followed this conversation my king please before you go is it possible to have you on saturday on, a, on another conversation when will you be free friday or saturday um let's try saturday saturday night please saturday could be very okay because yes we have a, a special you know why i'm saying this your absence has also you know uh, uh, bring a setup on the way forward so let's just um come back on saturday rewind most of the things that we are supposed to talk about even the farmers of thought we've not really got uh, gone into the uh, series to put particularly the structure so it will be necessary if we can have you again on saturday please this saturday that's very well that's well we can, we can actually regroup and uh, refocus on our strategy for farmers of thought and uh, uka yes. and aim and uh, as we are now settling in, in uh, Harare, uh, Zimbabwe, we will be able to share some news of what is happening. And as I said initially, we are setting up another studio here in Africa and uh, uh, equipment is all here, just waiting for the hardwares, the hard drives and the servers and we'll be ready to run. But I think on Saturday will be a good that we reunite again. And I want to thank you again for extending uh, your invitation and uh, big thank you to all your guests and not forgetting my contributors also my fellow uh, panelists who support me in my absence we send our greetings and lots of love and appreciation and with those few words i would say uh, shukran sande sana lala salama mobata shakanaka nilale ka kuhle enkos bayete Bayete, Bayete, my king, Bayete. Thank you so much. You've all heard Saturday, same time. Uh, we're going to have another session with Dr. King Maponga on strategy, structure, and way forward. Thank you so very much, my king. Good night to you. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Yeah, I want to thank all you, my family, my family. I mean, there are many of you. Please don't go because King Maponga is not here. I saw 200 and plus watching on only this source and the, the Facebook. Please don't go. Don't go because I still have a short announcement to make to us on, on, on who is coming tomorrow, who will be here uh, during the weekend. Now we already know that King Maponga is going to be here on Saturday. But who is going to tomorrow? We also know that we've missed our brother Rutendo for so long, and he's been going around putting some historical facts, and they're working on a lot of projects also out there. I mean, this is also one of the brothers that we want to get touch to get in touch with him again. I spoke to him this morning, and he he said he might be with us tomorrow, and that's going to be a very important conversation that we'll be talking on Wednesday about the art talk, social entrepreneurship, creativity, innovations, and um. Yes, we're still trying to keep uh, uh, in touch with 
uh, Kayama Art, who, who we spoke uh, spoke about from, you know, these artists and painters and street um, um, boys um, and our youth that are really creating their space with the African narratives that we're talking about, connecting and uniting one another. But because of the low uh, connection and uh, internet and this, and this and this, we're not sure really at this timing point to always get in touch with uh, those on the continent or in spaces that inter internet is not actually for favorable. And that's also another way that, you know, they start disconnecting uh, too strong. We're getting too powerful. We're getting too non knowledgeable. We're uniting a lot and it's, it, in this very short time, right? So I look forward to having all of us here again. Please don't just keep in touch. Just keep in touch. Make sure that you are subscribed. Make sure that you've clicked on your notification bell. As you see, we were using another studio today. Um, trying to put the structures uh, together because the other ones sometimes throw out the guests. So we're testing another new one. We have totally four, four live streaming systems that we do, you know, just put it in case. And you know how much they, they, they continually bring us down at every point in time. Right. Another topic is our Black History Month. We can say anything about, but that's the creation. That's the only time where we sit together and we learn you know what happened uh, to our brothers in the diaspora um who did what and irrespective of the fact that we're saying it should not be on the same uh, uh, uh just for a month and i think we are extending so it's a start and what has always been but the future is different. So it's going to be a Black History Month. Our history, just like we're doing like this every year, 365 days, right? So, but this week or during this month, we would be having um, um, Professor Molifi Asante, who actually would be giving us um, a legacy about Malcolm X. Because I think he passed away in this February 24th or what, I still have to check and confirm with Baba Jume, who is actually helping us. Prophet Jume is, I mean, he is really, I mean, a king. He is connecting us to all these professors, these scholars and experts and teachers, those that have not really, uh, we've not had on, on, on the Pan-African Daily, and they would be coming to lecture us on this. So please do, oh my God, ah, look at this color, it's so crazy. <laughs> I don't know what's going, it's just acting and acting. So yeah. So we are going to host a lot of guys. I mean, you just do know most of them. Professor James Moore is going to be on again, I think, on Friday or Thursday. We would confirm that all our scholars, actually, that will be giving us the true history of how our brothers and sisters, our children, our stolen, kidnapped, hijacked from the continent, what they have also been going through. We've heard about the continent, about its 54 countries, about the leaders. We've learned a lot about, you know, issues that are going on. But is the continent paying attention to what has been going on to its diaspora? Is the continent, not only the leadership, all the continentals, be them the migrant, even in the Americas and in the diaspora, do they know the history of their brothers and sisters? When they meet on the street and they see each other, do they know what they've gone through? Do they know that most of the privileges that we are under, uh, that we are undergoing or enjoying today, some people had to lay down their blood until today. They still be hung. They still been killed and murdered everywhere. Do we know that? So Black History Month, when we say we celebrate the martyrs, the heroes, the struggles, and even the departed. We come together, we remember them, we share that with them. Most of the time when we talk about uh, Africa, some people always say, oh, no, it's not a geographic can. No, it is. It is us worldwide. And the, our, our diasporans, we the diasporans, are looking always on the continent, sharing the stories, sharing all the, the narratives, sharing the, the wars and everything. But it's the continent paying attention to their brothers and sisters do they study do they know who they are do they know wherever they are scattered around the world do they know so it's a challenge 
It's not a one-way thing. I can understand our brothers and sisters in America that are complaining and say the way the Continentals, even when they, they come to America, the way they treat them, the way they side with others. So we need to talk. We need to hold this conversation. It's not just only about developing, developing and even the unity with us start in the village. And if you have relocated on scholarship or whatever thing, and you are in the Americas, that's your village. So who is in that community? Who do you re refer to? Who do you look up to? Who do you connect to? Do you know the stories? Or you just also heard some history? So yes, Black History Month in year in, year out is when we connect in our communities, in our villages and compounds and learn particularly about the diasporans, what they went through. Most of us know nothing absolutely nothing just like we were cut off it is even on their part that they complain that the narratives the media which has always been so biased have never been showing anything opening up the doors to the continent for them of course we also do know that we were also cut off from the continent and we look at them all the black americans all these are caribbeans all these are jamaicans these are haitians this are this we never knew that those are our brothers that were taken away from us and today we call ourselves, we are Africans worldwide. We don't care where you are. So do you want us to call you, uh, this is an African from Ghana. This is an African from Cameroon. This is an African from Zimbabwe. So why do we call them African from America? African from Europe, African from UK. So let's also call ourselves on the continent, African from Nigeria, African from Congo. No, right? So these are all things that we have to fix together. And it's sometimes when we meet at this Black History Month, we should be cooking fufu and plantain and everything and celebrating. So we need to get our people out there in the diaspora. All of you that have locations and stuff, please make sure that you turn out, you host conferences on the Black History Month, you invite guests. If you are a migrant community out there, invite our brothers and sisters. We have a lot of people, even the children out there would tell you the story. Don't just go and like, oh, I just came here to study my book. I'm just harvesting my money. I'm just making my thing. And you don't even care. You don't even know anything until you get into trouble. Then you start looking for people and crying out, oh, they are our brothers. No, you need to also feel their pain. You need to know their history. You need to know their stories. You need to fight to connect back. It's a fight for us to unite. I can't pass on the street without seeing my brother and my sister asking, where are you from? And you just talk like, oh, these are Americans, oh, these are this. No, we are one. So we want to make this year's celebration a remarkable one everywhere that we are. Of course, us in Germany is still not possible because of the lockdown. So also we would have been doing open air and stuff like that. But it's a beginning. The most important thing is the spirit. Okay. So make sure you cook well coffee i'm seeing you synovia and, and and a cherry you people should be connecting you're all day in the state let us see you guys meet drive one day sit together you know and you eat some fufu and some plantains and some whatever <laughs> and post us those pictures we finally met today right so yes we wish you all a pleasant pleasant evening thank you so very much we had a very beautiful conversation today with dr king maponga and we're gonna have him again on saturday and let's look up for tomorrow if we had brother Ren, if not we're gonna be here ourselves and host ourselves okay thank you so very much good night to all of you and we see ourselves tomorrow bye bye cheers <laughs>
Join my campaign. Campaign 21 hashtag 1 million subscribers on the Pan African Daily TV YouTube. Be a volunteer. Apply now. Be the new Africa.